Well, today we come to a slightly uncomfortable passage and the content that might make us squirm a little. But this is why, as a church, we generally go through books of the Bible or chunks of Scripture. It means that we can't skip over the awkward and the uncomfortable parts that we might not want to talk about. We as a church, we want to preach and teach from all of God's Word because it's all important for the Christian life. It all has relevance for us today, and today's passage in particular. Just a heads up to parents, today we will be talking about sex and sexuality uh, in quite a frank way. Of course, there will be nothing crass or rude, but we will be dealing with some sensitive topics. However, if they watch TV after 8 o'clock at night or they're in secondary school, they will have heard far worse. So the ball is in your court. I just wanted to let you know before we begin. We're currently in a series in the Ten Commandments and we've been seeing how these commands of God have a relevance for our lives today. We've been trying to explore each of these commandments in a positive way. Now I've been thinking a lot about this and I think the reason why these commandments are put in the negative, why they come across negative, thou shall not, thou shall not, is because they're actually guarding something positive. Do not kill. Why? Because life is precious. Keep the Sabbath. Why? Because rest is good and it's important. Honour your parents. Why? Because family is something that needs to be protected and cherished. Today's command is you shall not commit adultery. And that's a pretty clear command, isn't it? Why is it there? Because marriage and sex are good things and they need to be guarded. So here's the plan for this morning. I plan to look at what God's plan for sex is, look at what the Old Testament and the New Testament have to say, and then think about where forgiveness, hope and healing can be found. Now, I don't want this to be a negative thing. I want this to be a positive time. If you've been in church all your life, I'm sure you've heard some pretty grim sermons or talks, maybe in youth club, uh, about sex, sexuality and purity. Often these are done with the best intentions, with the right heart, but often they've done a lot of damage. It may be that these talks have left people with an overwhelming sense of shame and without any gospel hope. That's not what we want to do this morning. It might be that sex has been talked about in such a negative way that when it comes to marriage, people are not able to enjoy it the way they should, particularly if they've messed up earlier in their life. Sex is a topic that we need to discuss as a church. There's no room for being prudish when it comes to discipleship. If you've come to faith later on in life, then chances are you're coming with baggage and sexual brokenness. And the good news is that healing can be found in Jesus. But if we never speak about these things, if they're just swept under the carpet, they do have a tendency to come back and haunt us in different ways. So it's important that we take time to think about sex and sexuality from a biblical perspective. Parents need to do this too, don't they? If you don't teach your children about sex, then the world will. And we know the world has some pretty warped views on the subject. So with all that in mind, let's come to the Lord and pray and ask for his blessing on us and on our time this morning. Lord, we come to a sensitive subject this morning. We ask for you to speak to us. We want to hear from you. I ask that you might give me wisdom and clarity and grace as I explain your word. Minister to us by your spirit, we pray. We pray that you would bring about conviction of sin, but more than that, you would bring about healing, forgiveness and restoration. In Jesus' name. Amen. Who was it that had the first sexual thought? Well, of course, the answer is God. God is the creator of sex. Within the right parameters, sex is something that's good, pure and holy. And outside of those parameters, it can be devastating. The old analogy is that sex is like fire. In the fireplace, it's great. But if you take the coals out of the fireplace and put them somewhere else, It will bring about destruction. Tim Keller says this, Sex works a lot like fire. It can warm, comfort and purify. But if not handled with care, it can also burn, infect, scar and destroy. And that's true, isn't it? 
Sex within marriage is a good and honourable thing. It's a gift from God that's to be enjoyed. But if you take it out of that context and bring it into any other situation, then it's wrong and it will do damage. According to the Bible, God's design for sex is that it's supposed to be between one man and one woman in a loving marriage for life. That's God's design for sex. That's his plan, one man and one woman in a loving marriage for life. So everything else that doesn't fall into those parameters falls short of God's design for sex. Well, some people might be thinking, well, what about this? Can we do this? Is this thing acceptable? Well, I mean, every sexual practice, everything that doesn't fall into God's parameters are wrong, according to the word of God. In the New Testament, uh, the word we often see uh, for sexual immorality in the Greek is the word pornea. I'm sure you've guessed that's where we get the word pornography from. It's an all-encompassing term that deals with every sexual act or every sexual thought that doesn't happen within the God-given parameters. An example of this being used, the word pornea being used is in Galatians 15 uh, verse 19. Uh, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. God's word is clear that all sexual activity outside of these parameters are sinful acts. Now, this might make some people feel angry, but that's what the creator of the universe has to tell us, his creation. God's word spells out that adultery is sin in three different ways. Firstly, it's a sin against our marriage. It breaks the promises that we have made to our spouse. In marriage, we promise faithfulness, love, as long as we live. But adultery breaks this. It breaks trust. It destroys relationships. And it causes the deepest heart imaginable. Secondly, it's not just your own family it will destroy. It destroys the other party's family as well. It wrecks so many lives. So it's a sin against your family, but also the other family as well. And thirdly, of course, it's a sin against God. God created marriage and we come before him and we make promises. And we, when we break those promises, we're not just being unfaithful to our spouse. We're actually being unfaithful to God as well. God says, you shall not commit adultery. Now when we think about adultery, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ come to mind. He says this, you have heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand eye causes you to sin, then gouge it out and throw it away. It's, for it's better to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown to hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. In this passage, Jesus really raises the bar, doesn't he? He's saying it's not just about the act of adultery, but it's about the heart. If you look at someone and have a sexual thought about them, then according to Jesus, that is adultery adultery in your heart. Jesus says it's all very well and good not having an affair but what's the condition of your heart like? What's your thought life like? Well what does this mean for us? We live in a broken, confused and mixed up world when it comes to sexuality. All sorts of things are promoted as good Sexual freedom, sexual liberation, personal satisfaction, your rights. Well, this should come as no real surprise. Sex and relationships are a gift from God. It's no wonder the devil wants to twist and distort these great gifts. He wants to cause pain. He wants to cause confusion. He wants to break down marriages. Why? Because sex and relationships are good and God-given gifts. And he has come to kill, steal and destroy. I wonder, have you bought into the lies of the devil? The lies of the world, the flesh, 
and the devil. Well, let me just look at two of these lies we might buy into. Lie number one, just follow your heart. Now, this is something you hear all the time. Follow your heart. Do what makes you feel happy. Do what's good for you. Do what feels good. The problem with that is our hearts don't always want what's good and what's right. Now, if you've been on Facebook over this week, week you might have seen uh, the, the many different videos going around of the queues going for miles and miles long, queuing to get into McDonald's drive through Well, that's proof that the heart doesn't always want what's good for it. If you just follow your heart and be led by your own desires and your own lusts, then you'll find yourself in a difficult place, in a dangerous place. So that's lie number one, just follow your heart. Lie number two is this, that God wants to spoil your fun and restrain your freedom. A lot of people think that God is a party pooper. He just wants to come along and spoil your fun. He wants to come along and pop your balloon. However, that's not the case at all. God has given us guidelines to protect us and to keep us safe. Now, here's an illustration that I heard. I, found, I thought it was quite helpful. Imagine there's a fish and one day he decides he's absolutely sick and tired of being constrained to living in a lake. He's had enough. So he jumps out of the lake and onto dry land. That freedom that he experiences will be short-lived. Why? Because he'll be dead. If you try to set a fish free by helping him escape the water, you're not helping at all. You're actually killing it. A fish is most free when it's in the environment that it was created to be in. Well, that's the same for us as well. Real freedom is not is, is found not by living and embracing our desires. Real freedom is not found in doing whatever we want. Real freedom is actually found by living according to our design. Living within the guidelines that God has created for us. Now, there'll be all sorts of different people watching this video this morning. Some of you will be doing great and these things won't be an issue for you. Well, praise God for that. But others will be struggling. Some of you might be caught up in looking at pornography. Or others might be reading trashy romance novels, fantasising and lusting. Some of you might be on the edge of crossing a line. Perhaps now that you're working from home, you're emailing and texting your colleagues a lot more. And maybe these conversations are beginning to cross the line. They're getting flirty. There might be some who are actively uh, in sinful sexual relationships. Other people will be dealing with the guilt and baggage of past sexual experiences. Sexual desire, if left unchecked, will destroy you. And if you're married, it could destroy your marriage as well. Is there hope for you? Is there hope for your marriage? Oh yes, absolutely. Forgiveness and healing can be found in Jesus. Now I want to tell you a story found in John 8. Early one morning, Jesus was teaching a crowd. Then all of a sudden, there was a bit of a commotion. The scribes and the Pharisees, they, they drag a half-naked lady in front of the crowd. It turned out that this lady had been caught in the act of adultery. The scribes and the Pharisees, they, they wanted Jesus to condemn her. They wanted him to say that she deserves to be stoned to death for her sin. Instead, Jesus uh, catches them off guard. He says, now whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Now these men, they were uh, challenged by this and one by one they slipped off because they realised that they were sinful too. Jesus says to her, where are your accusers? Where are they? Does no one condemn you? And she answers, no. Well, Jesus says to her, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, notice the order here. Jesus doesn't say, now go and clean up your act and then I'll forgive you. No, that's not what he says at all. He says, I don't condemn you. I forgive you. Now go and live a pure life. As a result of being forgiven, live a holy life. Let me just make a quick uh, side note here. Um, as a church, we need to remember these words. We can quite easily communicate that everyone needs to have it all together before they walk through our doors. And that is wrong. 
That's not the way it goes. We welcome all, from all backgrounds, from every range of brokenness imaginable. We don't condemn. We love. We show them Jesus. And once they've repented of their sin, we teach them and we disciple them how to live a life that pleases God. We can't expect people to walk through our doors having it all together. If we're doing our job properly, we'll have people from all backgrounds coming through the door, from all sorts of carnage and chaos. And when they encounter the good news of Jesus, that's when they change. We don't make them change uh, before they've encountered the Lord Jesus because that is absolutely meaningless. So let's, let's get back to it. Maybe this morning your sins have been exposed to you and you realise what you've been doing is wrong. Well, come before Jesus and ask him to forgive you and he will. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, Paul lists a whole bunch of different sins and then he says this, And such were some of you. You guys were all involved in this carry on. But now you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God offers to wash away our sinful past and to cleanse us and to purify us and to give us a brand new heart. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross so that you might be forgiven of your sin. Come to him and experience forgiveness and healing and the power to live a life that fights sin. Come before Jesus and ask him to forgive you and he will. Then once you've been forgiven, continue to ask him to help you live a life that pleases him. Put your trust in him. Well, some people here might be thinking, Kieran, but I'm already a Christian and I'm battling these things. I wonder, have you ever made the mistake of putting the wrong type of fuel in your car? If you put petrol in a diesel car, then you're going to have problems, aren't you? In the same way, we need to make sure we are putting the right stuff into ourselves spiritually. If you fill yourself with the right stuff, then sinful desires begin to minimise in our life. They will never go away, but they can lose their power and grip over you. Thomas Chalmers, the great Scottish preacher from the 1800s, called this the expulsive power of the new affection. The expulsive power of the new affection. I love that phrase. But basically he's saying that slavery to sin can be defeated by having a stronger attraction to something else. Basically fall more in love with Jesus. Look at his beauty and his glory. If you're not bathing in the word of God, if you're not delighting in your relationship with him, then you are never going to be free. Get to know God, get close to him, be in his word, seek him in prayer. And as you do these things, your sinful desires begin to melt away. But it's an active fight, isn't it? You can't just be passive, it's an active fight as well. Some of you over the past few weeks in this nice weather, you might have been barbecuing, having a, a nice time in the garden. Well, what always happens is when you sit down, ready to enjoy your meal, a wasp comes along and shows interest in your dinner. What do you do? Do you say, sit down and enjoy a burger? No, you don't. You pick up the newspaper or whatever's to hand and you whack it. Well, it's the same with sin. We don't be passive about it. We are active. We remember what Jesus says. If your eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, then cut it off. That's serious language. Of course, blind people still lust, don't they? People with one hand still struggle with sin. So Jesus isn't saying literally go and cut off your hand or gouge out your eye but what he is saying is you need to take drastic action it might be that you need to disconnect the internet from your house it might be that you need to break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend maybe you need to talk to the elders or go to counseling perhaps your marriage is on its last legs you need to fight jesus is saying you need to be ruthless you need to do whatever it takes to deal with the problem of sin in your life do whatever it takes no matter the cost no matter the inconvenience you shall not commit adultery why because marriage is special it's actually a picture of something greater marriage is the union between a man and a woman the two become one flesh Marriage is about exclusivity. You're taking on one man or one woman for life. 
Marriage is about unconditional acceptance. You accept to you agree to love and accept that person no matter what for the rest of your life. That union in marriage is a picture that we're united to Christ. That exclusivity in marriage points to the fact that God is God and we shall have no other gods before him. That unconditional acceptance, well that points to the fact that God sees us in all our nakedness and shame, yet he still loves us for who we are. Let me just finish by telling you a story. There was a man who was in prison. He was in prison for stealing. That was a big problem. He was in and out of jail all the time. He was always stealing things. And he got three years this time. Early on in the sentence, he went to the chapel and he heard the chaplain give a gospel message and he repented of his sin and put his trust in Jesus. He was wonderfully converted. After three years, he was getting close to his release date and he was worried. He was worried that he would fall back into his old way of life, that his old friends would drag him back down, that he would get back into his sin of stealing. Well, eventually he was released from prison and it was tough. But on the first Sunday, he went to church. He didn't know which church to go to. He just went to the local church and he sits down on his pew and he looks around and he sees the communion table. He sees uh, the pulpit and all the things. He sees um, plaques on the wall remembering the war dead. And he turns to his right and he looks at another plaque. And it's a plaque of the Ten Commandments. And he reads them and he gets to the one about stealing you shall not steal and he feels a deep sense of condemnation he reads it again and he feels condemned he feels agitated he's about to get up and leave the service because he, he can't deal with this condemnation but he remembers something that he heard in chapel you are a new creation the old has gone the new has come and he reads those commands again but this time he sees them quite differently. Instead of seeing them as commandments, he sees them as promises. You shall not steal. He sees that as a promise from God, that he is a new creation. His affections have changed and now he can say, I will not steal. And that's the exact same for sexual sin. You are a new creation. Forgiveness and healing is possible. You can be set free. Look to Jesus. Now I mentioned earlier, sometimes churches can get it wrong the way they talk about sex. Well, we're going to watch a short video on that topic and we'll see the damage that it can cause, but we'll also see what Jesus thinks about it. And then we're going to sing a song. It's a song that's an invitation to come to Jesus to be forgiven. We'll come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness and healing are bought with the precious blood of Jesus. It invites us to come and to lay our sin at the foot of the cross and experience the healing and forgiveness that's on offer to us. Let's just pray to finish. Lord, we are weak and sinful people and we need your help. Forgive us, heal us and restore us. Protect us as a church. Protect our marriages. Protect us as individuals. Help us to live and thrive according to your design. Amen.